this meeting is actually uh, organized and prepared and uh, by the vineyard south africa and it is a crucial conversation that we feel we need to have uh, as a people as a people of god and as a people of this country so we welcome you in this conversation and we are hoping that you are going to have fun with us um i'm just quickly going to read the guidelines on how we are going to engage tonight all of us we are allowed to be angry we are allowed to be emotional but we are not allowed to be disrespectful you are allowed to say what is in your heart but you are not allowed to be unloving you are allowed to disagree with the other people but you are not allowed to dehumanize other individuals during question and answer session you can choose the following ways to engage you can send a private message to myself Pablo Tekiso you'll see the name that will appear on your screens or you can choose to send a private message to another name on the participant list which is Trevor Davis you are welcome to send your message on the public platform chat and send your questions there where everybody can see them and type them out if you don't want to type them out uh, you are welcome to raise your hand you can use at the bottom of your screen there is a reactions thing where you can raise your hand as you can see on my top left i think top right for you and you can raise your hand and then you'll be recognized when it's time for us to engage and we can recognize you and give you a time to ask your question live or to ask it um, on audio or video. I hope those guidelines are all understood and all of us um, will be able to respect those. So Dr. Zianda, I'm just quickly going to open this conversation in prayer and then we'll get straight into it. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together on this platform. Lord, we admit, these have been tough times of COVID. Lord, we admit that this has been uncertain times in COVID. Lord, but we want to thank you that even in those tough and challenging times, you have never left us, you have never forsaken us, you have been with us up to this far. Mighty God, we mourn the lives that we've lost up to this far. And we celebrate the lives, mighty God, that we still have today. So we give you glory and we thank you. Please be with us in this conversation this evening. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive. Mighty God, I pray, may your love reign this evening. May your love reign this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Just lastly, I'm going to ask for the last time, in case you joined us late, please mute your mics. If your mic is going to interfere with the conversation, I am going to remove you from this conversation. And I don't want to do that. So I'm asking for the last time, please mute your mics. Dr. Zianda, thank you so much for being with us here and for availing yourself. I need to explain as well that we had Dr. Jenny Durant, who was supposed to be with us this evening. And I received a message from her this afternoon that she's just tested positive for COVID and she has fever 
and a slight headache. And she felt that she wouldn't be at her best to join this conversation. So she has sent her apologies and she's with us in spirit. So please pray for Dr. Jenny that she said to me, she knows because she has vaccinated fully and she has taken a booster. She knows that she, she will have mild symptoms, but for precaution sake, she decided to stay at home and not join us this evening. So please pray for um, Dr. Jenny. But we have Dr. Zianda this evening as I've introduced her earlier. And doctor, I would like us to start with this question. Many of us are confused about this different variants that we are hearing about. Can you in simple terms, in layman's terms, explain to us what is a variant and how does a variant develop? Is it really a man-made thing? What is really this thing? Because first we had the beta variant, then we had the delta variant, and now we are being told about the o Omicron or Omicron variant. So can you just in brief explain to us what a variant is, please? Um, thank you very much. First of all, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be part of your con of your conversation. Um, I'm hoping that um, through this conversation, I can be able to, to um, answer any questions that may come and allay any fears that people might have. Um, where I don't know, I will say I do not know, and um, and that is because that. Um, COVID is, is a relatively new disease and um, we are still learning a lot about it um, ourselves. Um, just to also say the reason why it's called COVID-19 is because um, it is a disease that is caused by coronavirus, um, which was discovered in, in, in 2019. So the 19 day is for 2019. If it was discovered what, this year for the first time, it would be called COVID-21, but it's called COVID-19 for that reason. Um, now to answer your question related to the variants. So um, all viruses mutate, um, that's just their way of making sure that they survive. Viruses are organisms, they are part of the, of the organism family. They are just smaller organisms, we even call them microorganisms. And their, their um, mandate, if I can call it that, is to survive. They want to survive and they want to continue to survive. And, um, and as, as, they, as they continue to survive in doing so, they multiply. Just like we humans, we multiply uh, in order to make sure our species continue to, continues to survive. So the viruses also multiply and as they multiply and occupy spaces within, within our, our bodies or whichever the host um, that, uh, that they, they have infected, um, as they multiply and occupy those spaces, they are met with um, the environment in that space. Um, they are met with the environment within our bodies that may not necessarily be um, uh, favorable to them. And so in order to try and keep their survival, they will mutate. Mutating just basically means they, they change, they, they, try, uh, they try to find a way to change the, their structure or, or, or to develop a, a, another protective layer to make sure that they survive. So all viruses do this. It's not unique to the COVID virus. All of the viruses do this. I like the way my colleague um, Jenny explained it uh, when we were talking about it earlier by saying that it's like um, when you as a, as a parent or as parents, are, um, you have children, um, your children are not the same. You are multiplying through your children, but your children will not be the same. They will have different characteristics and that's what mutations are, are different characteristics. There's one, one of your children may be a math genius, another one may be good at sport, another one may be artistic, another one may not 
uh, like any of the things that you know I mentioned, may be just good at taking care of other people. So um, they have different characteristics. So mutations are like different characteristics um, and also a way to, 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 to protect, for the virus to protect themselves and ensure their own survival. Um, just to add that, uh, to give an example, um, we all have grown up knowing about flu. Flu, the normal flu that we all get is caused by an influenza virus. The name of the virus, we call it influenza. Um, that particular virus mutates every single time. I'm sure you've heard that um, when we encourage um, the elderly and the very young ones to vaccinate against flu, we do it every single year. And the reason why we do it every single year is because the virus has mutated. And so um, we need to then adjust our vaccine for the flu to make sure that it is effective against the, the new variant of flu. So I hope um, that uh, explains the, the question about the variants. So doctor, just to be clear, are you saying that it is the same virus that changes character that becomes a new thing? It's not something that is totally new that's coming from somewhere. It is something that exists that just changes character. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. That, that is correct. It changes its, its, its characteristics. It's, it modifies its characteristics as it's trying to survive within a, a different or hostile environment. And sure. when, you, when, when we talk about um, the, you know, I'm sure you've heard a, a lot during this um, Omicron fiasco, you've heard a lot of people talking about sequencing um, is, is to try and understand those different characteristics. And through that sequencing process, they can be able to see that it is still the same virus because it has got some of the characteristics of the original variant, but it has also has different characteristics that it has modified in order to survive a particular environment and continue thriving. Hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear because um, we hear that there's a new variant. One minute we hear some, before we heard there was Delta that came from India and then another variant that came from another country and we never understand how they are developed. So it's good to hear from you as a specialist how these things work, you know? Now, doctor- um, I, think, I think that the naming of the variants is to just make it easy for the, the, the the everyday normal people to, to know that we have a different variant instead of using the scientific names that are there. So, um, um, so, so all of these variants, they're called Delta, Omicron, Beta, Alpha, they actually have scientific names based on the different mutations or characteristics that have been found. But it is much more easier to give it a certain name, not because um, of anything other than to make it easy to understand that we are dealing with a, a different variants. The same applies with the influenza virus that I talked about that causes flu. Um, it has got, the, the different variants of it have got different names, scientific names. We just mm. have never been in a situation where we, we, we even have to then give them different uh, uh, lay, 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 layman's terms to it. So we just keep the term uh, flu because everybody just understands flu. But in the background, we know today, uh, this year we are doing, dealing with H1N3 vi uh, viral strain. And then the next time we are dealing with H1N7. Those are scientific names of the, the different variants of the same flu virus, which is influenza. Sure, that is actually very helpful um, for us to understand, um, doctor, because um, many of us have been wondering, as I said earlier, how all of these things work. But now doctor, here is a funny but serious question. In South Africa, we've had uh, local municipal elections recently. And we have seen our numbers were very low of infections. And we saw political parties from different uh, continents, I mean, provinces in this country, 
gathering people in stadiums and and our number still remains low. And all of a sudden, after the elections, the numbers are up and there is a new variant and there is all of these things. And somehow people told us back in February that there'll be a new variant in December and now it's here. And people are actually wondering, I man, this thing should be man-made, this one. How can people know how these things work? And why was COVID dead during the elections? Why didn't we see those infections? Because people were gathering in large numbers in stadiums and different places. How do we explain this scientifically? Because to someone like me, it does not make sense. Um, just to say that it's, it's a very good question that you are asking and it's an important question and I'm glad that you understand it. I mean, you, that you ask it um, so that we can dispel any any um, ideas of a possible conspiracy going on here. There is no conspiracy going on. Uh, what is happening is that when viruses infect uh, a, a person, in fact, not just viruses, any infectious agent, when it infects an individual, um, there is a period that uh, in the scientific community we call it an incubation period. And that period differs from one microorganism to the next. So an incubation period basically is the period during which um, the, after the, the, the organism has entered the body, during which it can take from infecting or entering the body of an individual to causing symptoms, okay? So you may, be, you may have gotten the infection today, but you will not know that you've gotten the infection today. You will only know that you were infected once you start experiencing certain symptoms. It's as simple as that. So now the incubation period, which is the time that it takes for the body to start re uh, reacting to this virus um, and trying to fight it in a way of trying to fight it, it also gives you certain symptoms and also the, 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 the virus itself will give you certain symptoms as part of the illness. So now, the, from the time it takes from infection to development of symptoms for the COVID uh, virus, it, is, it ranges from anything from two to 10 days. So, which means from the time that you were infected, let's say when you were in contact with somebody who has got COVID in, in close contact and that person infected you, you may not develop symptoms until two days later. And also depending on, on your own immune system and your own internal characteristics as an individual, some people may not develop symptoms until 10 days later. So that's why we say the incubation period is anything from two to 10 days. So that's why then when, um, for example, during the riots in, in, in KZN and a bit in Gauteng, we already knew that uh, after the riots, we will see an uptick in, in cases in, in, in those regions. Because when people were rioting, they, they were not observing social distancing. They were in close proximity to each other and therefore increasing the chances of infecting each other. So the same applies with um, the, the elections. Uh, during the, com the, the, the election campaigning bit close to the, uh, the, the actual elections and during the elections themselves, people were not observing social distancing and therefore they were probably infecting each other at that time, but they would not know that they are infected until two to 10 days later. And only then when people have symptoms, do they go for a test. So if, if you feel healthy, you don't have any symptoms, you don't have the desire or need to go for a test. And therefore we are not going to be able to pick it up from our, our lab test that actually the, 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 we've got so, so many numbers of people that are infected until people test. So people would go for a test when they start developing symptoms. And also when people start developing symptoms, most of the times people are not gonna go 
um, for a test the very same day that they have symptoms. So because also the, the symptoms that people experience with COVID are very non-descriptive symptoms. They are not symptoms that are specific to COVID. So for example, some people would experience a fever. How many diseases causes fever? Lots. Some people would experience um, a headache. How many diseases causes headache? Lots. And in fact, even, even situations that are not diseases, like um, I've had a hard day today or a stressful day today, and therefore I'm going to have a headache. Um, and, and because I have this headache and it's nothing unique, I'm not going to go for a test immediately. I might go for a test when the headache persists. So that's when we are then able to pick up the, 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 the positive cases. And, and it just so happens that the positive cases will also be picked up way after the elections because of the incubation period and the time it takes for people to go for a test. Sure. Thank you so much, Doctor. That, that actually helps. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that one, there's an incubation time that people take before they go for tests. So because the elections were like two, three weeks ago, if I understand you well, some of these spikes that we are seeing, you suggesting that it might be from those times when people were infecting each other and reinfecting each other. And then we're seeing a spike later because of incubation time. And therefore, yes. how do we, and therefore, doctor, how do we explain scientifically how people can predict when there will be another wave. We've been waiting for this wave and we thought it's a high, this COVID thing is ending. And now indeed we have, see, we're seeing another wave. Can you just explain to us scientifically how that works? Um, it's observing patterns. It's observing patterns, understanding human behavior and also understanding the patterns of the, the virus gene, the viruses gene, if I can call it that. So I, I can give you an example. Um, uh, in last year, a friend of mine was um, going to get married and, and he, in fact, no, not, uh, yes. And then they made um, the wedding date to be somewhere in June. Um, I, I, I kept quiet and I didn't say much about it. And then in the, when we were, um, when we saw the, 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 the second wave in December last year, we saw the second wave and then the second wave ended around January, end of January. And so in February, the wedding is supposed to be in June this year. In February, I thought, I can't sit on this. I must tell my friends so that they can do something about it. I said to him, um, we are likely to have another wave in June. So I wouldn't have a wedding in June if I were you. Um, and don't have a wedding in December either. Maybe have a wedding in October. That was my suggestion. Um, and, and, and then I kept on uh, giving him the, the, pro, the, you know, the stats as they come, you know, as we're watching the cases go down and or up, I kept sending him. So come May, the, the wedding was, had to be canceled because in June, we were in the middle of a third wave. Um, we were starting a third wave in June. So the wedding had to be canceled and they had a wedding in October. Now, the reason I was able to meet that prediction, I must just say that the ability to make a certain, th those predictions is only by the, 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 the certain types of scientists that are specialized in that field. Um, because it involves observing patterns, it involves of, uh, understanding human behavior, it involves understanding the, the, the behavior of the virus. It also involves having um, the ability to use statistics uh, to make predictions. I am not one of those specialized people, okay? But I was able to make that prediction based on understanding people's behavior based on understanding, um, uh, following the patterns. And, and so, um, because I understood that what happened in December last year was 
uh, when, when the second wave started, it was uh, triggered by congregations. Um, and I'm not talking uh, church congregations. I'm just talking about people congregating. It was triggered by people coming together in large numbers, congregating, specifically um, the matriculants that went out somewhere in Deben and had matric dances and even in Cape Town, matriculants going out partying end of the year and whatever. Now the, the challenge is at that time, young people specifically, they had a laser fair kind of attitude to say, but um, it, it doesn't affect me. Young people don't die for this, from this disease. But the challenge is the young people still get infected and bring the infections home. So when I observed that, they bring the infections home and they bring them to their families and friends and neighbors. So when I observed what happened in December, I was able to then predict that we are likely to have a third wave in during our winter period, because that's when we again keep ourselves indoors. It's cold. We want to keep ourselves indoors and we are even close to each other. We do not have a lot of ven ventilation going on. So the chances of us uh, infecting each other are higher. Now, again, for the December, my prediction is because in December, that's when we want to congregate and, and have um, ceremonies, joyous ceremonies, not so joyous ceremonies. That's what when we congregate together as, as communities. And because we do that, it's hot. Yes, there's good enough ventilation because some of the stuff, um, we may be doing it outside and we're opening our windows and doors. But if we, if, if we observe what is happening in some of our communities, when it's hot, no one cares to wear a mask, although everybody knows they should be wearing a mask because people are not sick, they do not feel sick. Um, they go around uh, uh, thinking they, they can just not wear a mask. And in the process, um, when you are in that party, in that bright area, in that wedding, in that funeral, you are busy infecting each other. So the predictions are based on that. It's not because someone has planned for it that it must happen in December again so that we can close the country down. No, no one wants to close the country down. Hey, doctor. You know, these things that you guys explain from science and predictions to lay people like us, they become difficult. But thank you for that explanation because even though I'm not a doctor, I think I can understand what you've just explained. Now, doctor, before I open the floor for questions, we, we're talking about vaccines and uh, these vaccines have caused lots of problems for all of us because we don't know what to believe. One minute we are told it's going to protect us from this virus. One minute we are told, no, you are being infected with a chip. One minute we are told lots of stories. But now doctor, for some people who've taken the vaccine, they thought they were now protected from this virus. But now because there's a new variant, the question now becomes, do we need another vaccine for this new variant or those who've taken the vaccine and they're fully vaccinated right now are fully protected from this new variant? And what is this, while you answer that, please explain this new thing that we are hearing about called boosters. Why do we need boosters? So please just help us understand this process of this vaccine and Again, people believe it's just a money-making scheme. And the way things are going, we thought by now we would have been done with this thing. But now every time there's a new variant, it sounds like there's another vaccine, there's a booster. What is this um, vaccine and how does it actually work, doctor? Okay, so in terms, I'm, I'm gonna try and start with the booster. Uh, to answer the booster part first, and and I'll work I'll work my way backwards. 
Um, having boosters in vaccines is not a new thing. Um, I, I'm sure uh, many of you who have children know about the, the vaccine schedule for kids from the time they are born until the age of 12. You know about that. And if you look at that vaccine schedule, it starts off with polio. Uh, as soon as the baby comes out, uh, the baby is taken to the little area with a lamp and a warm little bed and cleaned up and given an, Oreo, an, an, an oral oleo, uh, uh, polio vaccine. And they given an injection uh, for TB, a, a TB vaccine, as soon as they come out of the mother's womb. But guess what? Six weeks later, they're gonna be given another polio vaccine. And guess what? 12 weeks later, they're going to be given another polio vaccine. And if you look at that schedule, there's many vaccines. I'm, I'm not gonna remember all of them. There's, there's the polio vaccines, there's the TB vaccine, there's the uh, influenza vaccine that I'm talking about that causes flu. Um, the virus that causes flu. There is the, the, the diphtheria vaccine. There's a lot of uh, vaccines that are used to protect children against diseases. And if you look at that schedule, you will see that up until the age of 18 months, specifically, children are receiving more or less the same type of vaccines from the day they are born to the, the, the time they are 18 months. And it's, it's, it's different um, doses and some of them being boosters. And when they are five years old, they again get a tetanus booster. It's a booster. So boosters are not a new thing. Um, and then at 12 years old, we now give them the HPV vaccine. So just to explain again that boosters are not something new. Now, why boosters? The reason why people, uh, vaccines have got boosters is number one, when you're giving a vaccine, right? The vaccine is supposed to uh, trigger an immune response in, in, in your body so that when you actually get the infection, your immune response, your immunity is aware uh, recognizes this thing um, that I think the immune, the, your immunity will say, I think we've seen this before, but they may not have seen the actual virus. They saw the vaccine. So the immune, will, the immune system is going, I think I've seen this before. So um, I know how to deal with it because the, the immune system has already developed an attack mechanism. And therefore the individual doesn't get sick or the sickness that they get does not get severe. Now, what happens with some vaccines is that, in fact, with most vaccines, the, the immunity wins over time, which means it gets less and less over time. Hence, needing a second dose or hence needing a booster. All of, most vaccines are like that. Um, I think um, the, the, the one that doesn't have many boosters um, I think the yellow fever vaccine, if my memory serves me well, when you get a yellow fever vaccine, it will tell you will be told you will have to come back for um, the, another, the, the next vaccine for yellow fever again in 10 years time. But most vaccines need boosters. So boosters are not a new thing. They are to, the reason why they are called boosters, it's to boost the immune system, to boost that immune response as it is getting less and less. So we want to make sure that your immune levels are, are kept at a, at, a, at, a, at a good level to be able to attack the virus that comes in. Um, so, so doctor, was, yeah. sorry, doctor. So boosters are not another money-making scheme and they are not new. It is just what happens when you have a vaccine that sometimes you'll need to give a shot to boost your immune system. That's correct. Just check okay. that immunization card of the kids. You will see that the vaccines that are there, you, you see the similar names as you work your way down that, that thing. 
Thank you, Doctor. You can answer that second question. Uh, remind me again. <laughs> um, the second question was whether we are protected from the Johnson and Johnson and the Pfizer when we are fully vaccinated. Okay. Um, so you were asking whether the Johnson and Johnson and the Pfizer protect against Omicron. Hmm. Uh, the quick answer is we do not know yet. We discovered this Omicron variant last week. We are still studying it. Um, there are concerns that have been raised and the concerns that have been raised was that because of the mutations, the different characteristics that are in this Omicron variant uh, that are different to the other variants that we've had, um, to which the vaccines were developed to act against, because there's different mutations or those different characteristics, there is concerns that uh, our current vaccines may not be as effective uh, against Omicron, but we do not know yet. We are still studying that. Um, secondly, they, there are some studies that are currently underway and the ones that are currently underway so far, they have indicated that uh, uh, Omicron does not escape vaccine protection. What I mean by that is that so far they've indicated that um, the, the vaccine that people have received is still protecting them against uh, Omicron, but it's too early to tell. Sure. So it's still too early to tell, but for now, those who are fully vaccinated can be assured for now that they are still protected from the virus. Yes, those, those who are fully vaccinated can still be assured. You must remember that just because we have Omicron doesn't mean Delta has gone. Mm. It doesn't mean the other variants have gone, right? Um, and so uh, we might be having, we, we are having a situation of uh, variants, different variants of the same virus that are competing um, for space in our bodies. So mm. our best protection right now is to vaccinate each other and uh, ourselves and to ensure that we continue to observe those uh, um, um, those, those, those safety precautions. That, that is the only bet we've got. We don't have another bet. Um, as more information becomes available, then more information will be shared. And the reason why South Africa, you know, uh, we have been criticized and, and as well as um, uh, praised for reporting on the vaccine, on the variant, uh, uh, as we discover it, uh, but one, one of those reasons is of doing so is to make sure that we can study it as quickly as possible. You will realize that once the variant was detected in South Africa, I want, I want to emphasize detected. It does not mean it originated in South Africa. We don't know where it originated from. And I don't think it even matters where it originated from. Um, so it was detected in South Africa because of the scientists continually um, uh, st studying the, the, the samples that are coming in, trying to understand uh, more about this, 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 this virus. And so once it was detected, other countries around the world started using the same um, methodology or similar methodology to try and study their samples to see if they can detect Omicron in the samples that they have. As we're talking right now, Omicron has been detected uh, in many countries. And while they are doing that, they are also trying to study uh, um, whether this variant is going to, is, is more transmissible, which means it infects more people than the previous variants. Um, whether this variant is going to cause severe disease um, compared to other variants, whether this variant is going to uh, cause more death compared to other variants, and whether this, this variant um, can 
can still um, be managed with the current vaccines. So now, because we detected it and we reported it, uh, we reported on it early, we have got multiple countries and multiple scientists around the world trying to understand and to be able, if there is a need to come up with a new vaccine, to come up with a new vaccine. If there is a need to adjust the currently existing vaccines, to adjust the currently existing vaccines. Hmm. Sure. Sure, that sounds like a, that sounds like a lot <laughs> to understand from a layman's point of view. But thank you so much for for that, and uh, we we appreciate that answer, Doctor. I I want to believe that we have a lot of people who have so many questions and so many comments, and they want to know and have you know we want to engage. So I'm about to open the floor for for an engagement. A quick reminder: we are allowed to engage openly we are not allowed to disrespect each other we are allowed to disagree but we are not allowed to be unloving so as we are entering this time of question and answers please remember god's love must still reign in this conversation so let us try to model that as we engage agree and disagree thank you i'm gonna go to is it Cribello uh, Dandala. Dandala, please unmute yes, that's yourself. Correct. Yes, please unmute yourself and ask the doctor the question. Oh, okay. Um, firstly, uh, Dr. Z, thank you so much for, for your presentation. You've certainly made this whole thing a lot more easy for us lay people to understand. So, my question um, has to do with what you were saying now. Um, with om om Omicron, if I'm saying it correctly. So if we simply detected it, okay, looking at how the world has responded, um, the way that we, we, we reported it, is that how it all the other variants have been reported? And by that, I mean, when they were detected, were they detected? and analyzed before they were announced or were they detected, communicated and only thereafter the assessments um, on them done and the analysis on them done. And the reason I'm asking is because, you know, the way the world has responded, it's, it's kind of like a chicken and egg situation now where you're kind of saying, all right, so we've got the ability to detect this. So do we keep, do we analyze and keep quiet as a country? and then speak once we've got some kind of analysis and better understanding? Or do we say, you know, fellow human beings, fellow, you know, citizens of the world, there's this new variant, be aware of it. Um, let's all dig in and, and figure out what it means without these punitive measures, which for all intents and purposes have befallen South Africa and our neighboring countries. So. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what what is the normal protocol, and did we in any way, shape, or form break that protocol in the way we announced Omicron? And if we didn't, what are your thoughts then on the way the world has reacted? Um, I don't know. Let me jump in quickly, Kribelo. Uh, uh, thank you for your question, and uh, we really appreciate it. When we were preparing for this conversation with Dr. Zianda. Um, I don't know how she feels now, but she specifically said, this is the question that's going to come up. And because it might take more of an engagement, which is, she's looking forward to, she was asking if we can pack the question for a little bit later. She wants to engage with the question. She will engage with the question, but she's asking if we can pack it and answer it just at the, at the, at the end, and then we'll come back to it. Is that okay, Kubelo? Great stuff. Thank you for your understanding. Doctor, there is a question here that um, we have we we have on 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 on, on the screen. And it says, um, please may I ask a question? I'm a GP practicing, um, I'm a GP practicing in Port Elizabeth. I have taken the J and J vaccine earlier this year, 
I've had a patient who was high risk for cardiovascular disease die unexpected, unexpectedly within a few days after having the Pfizer vaccine. She was elderly and had diabetes. Recently, an article released by the American Heart Association indicated that the vaccine causes inflammation within blood vessels based on a certain biomarkers. The risk of heart attack went from 11% to 25% in the study population. In the patient that I mentioned previously, I think that a heart attack or vascular event may explain a sudden death. Do you think, doctor, it is possible that the risk of vaccination in not it's not fully understood and that there will be a major lag in the big pharmaceutical companies with growing vaccines because of these risks? So that's the first question. And because this person is also a doctor, they are saying, I'm thinking of the drug called, I don't know if it's pronounced co correctly, but VIX or Vioxx, you might understand that doctor, which was withdrawn after it was discovered that there was a major increase in cardiovascular events. Doctor, I'm gonna pause there. Um, oh, the last line the person says is that it took four years for the ph pharmaceutical company to withdraw this drug called the, it's V-I-O-X-X, Vioxx or Vioxx. So doctor, please engage that question um, if you understood it correctly. Yes, I, I think I did. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I just want to say firstly that um, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I know how hard it is to lose a patient um, in as much as the, the family loses a, a loved one and, and, and grieves for, for, for that, we as doctors also grieve repeatedly. It's a traumatic situation when you lose, when you lose your patient. Um, I do hope that um, the, the person who posed the question to me actually reported that uh, particular death um, to, 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 the, to, the, to, to, to the department because any uh, severe uh, disease uh, or, or, and death that occurs within a short space of time post-vaccination needs to be reported and investigated. Now, having said that, um, um, the reason why it's important to have uh, deaths and, and severe diseases investigated is to make sure that we are able to understand and that whether that particular death or that particular disease uh, is directly linked um, and, and is as a result uh, of the, the severe side effect of the, of the vaccine or whether it is because of um, something that would have happened anyway, irrespective of the vaccine. Now, I'm sure my colleague understands that um, diabetes on its own also uh, uh, put it, pu puts one at high risk of cardiovascular uh, um, um, complications. And diabetes on its own also uh, causes an increase in one's um, inflammatory markers uh, on its own. So um, I would not be confident to say whether it was the Pfizer vaccine that resulted in the death of this individual or whether it was the, the, the underlying conditions that this individual would have had. Now, having said that, um, I want to uh, indicate that there is no medication in the world that doesn't have side effects. All medications that we take have side effects. Even Panado has side effects. Um, and, and, and some medication can have severe side effects, other medication can have a, a, a minor side effects. Um, one of the severe side effects of Panado, for example, is, is, is liver damage. But we take Panado every single time. We give it to our kids every single time because of weighing the risk of um, getting that severe side effect 
this is the risk of suffering from the condition that you are not treating with available medication. So yes, the risks are there, but um, the question is the risks that are there, how severe are they? And what are, the, what are the probabilities or the chances of getting those severe risks that do happen? So that, 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 that's, that's how I want to, to answer that. And then in terms of whether um, um, we, there may be uh, long-term effects that we don't yet understand, that's possible. I mean, um, this is a new vaccine that we are all using and we, we haven't observed the impact of, of it yet. The impact of any uh, 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 disease, number one, can only be seen years later. The impact of any treatment or, or whether it's medication or vaccination I, can also only be observed years later. It's not something that can be observed in the immediate period. So we are not able to say what is the impact of, of uh, um, the, the COVID as it is right now. We can say to some degree the impact of COVID because it killed so many people in such a short space of time. Um, but we, we can't say what is the impact of the vaccines at the present moment because um, apart from knowing that the vaccines uh, reduce the, the chances of, 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 of um, getting severely ill and they, and they reduce the chances of being uh, of dying from COVID. But in terms of the long-term effects, that's what I mean. In terms of the long-term effects of the vaccines, we can't say because we, we don't have long-term to refer to. Long-term has got to be measured in, in, in timelines that are long. So we can't talk about something that we don't know at the present moment. We can only know when time passes. Hmm. Sure, doctor. Thank you so much. Um, I just need to say, I just need to say, I'm reading a lot of comments and I'm seeing, if you have a question, that is not answered yet and you'd like that question answered please raise your hand we will recognize you and we'll give you a chance to ask your question it can be any question the purpose of this discussion is to open a platform and create a space for us to engage robustly and for us to try to get a better understanding of these medical terms that you are talking about so from people who are commenting on the chat box if we're going to talk about other discussions you can ask your questions and we will try to answer it if the doctor can answer it if the doctor can't she'll say she'll mention that she can't answer it thank you everyone doctor there is a question here and uh, it's twofold it's saying we are hearing about an increasing number of vaccinated people suffering from severe side effects e.g heart disease heart blood pressure with lifelong medication prescribed blood clots seizures to name a few they are also high risk to consider now the reason i'm asking that i know you've touched on it a bit it the, the, the second phase of this question says a well-known lancet study shows that vaccinated people transmit the virus and have a very high viral load can you please doctor explain this um and also mention if you know about this study I have not come across the study, um, but in my understanding, first of all, when you get vaccinated, the vaccines that we have do not contain the virus in them. So um, how you end up with a viral load, it's, it's exactly what, what the term says. The viral load means the load of virus cis in your system. So if you've got a certain, a smaller number of viruses, because remember I said, when the viruses get into your system, they want to multiply and they want to survive. So as they multiply, uh, in the beginning, their load is less, is, is smaller. And if they continue unabated, that, that means that there's nothing, your immune system is not attacking them, and they will continue to multiply and then the viral load will be higher. 
So you get a viral load, a higher viral load upon having been infected with the virus. So now um, um, uh, the people will have a viral load and uh, if they've been infected with the virus and then they will transmit the virus to others. The higher the viral load, the chances of transmission also increase. I'm sure um, people know about the viral load long before COVID because of HIV, because even in the HIV space, we're talking about a high viral load that the higher the HIV viral load in someone's system is, the higher the chances of that person transmitting the, the HIV virus to the next person. Now, I think there may have been a misunderstanding here in terms of the link between the viral load and the vaccine. If the vaccines had a virus in them, it, one would argue that maybe the virus came alive and then multiplied. But none of the vaccines that we use in the country have got the virus in them. None of them have got a whole virus in them. So there is no way that they would then uh, create a viral load from where there's there's no virus in them. Um, the the Pfizer vaccine uh, doesn't have any vir uh, any uh, 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 virus in it. May neither does the 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 the, the J and J vaccine. It doesn't have the COVID virus in it. So it's not going to be able to create a high viral load. What can happen is that people who are vaccinated can still get infected, right? Just because you are vaccinated doesn't mean you're not gonna get infected. You are still going to get infected, but the vaccine will attack that virus, right? The vaccine will attack the virus. In fact, it's your immune system that attacks the virus because the vaccine has done its work in your immune system so that your, your army, your, your, your immune army is ready when the virus comes and can attack the virus as quickly as possible. So the, 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 the challenge may be if that immune reaction did not happen fast enough. So for example, I got my booster two weeks ago. I could have gotten my booster two weeks ago and gotten infected two days after getting the booster. My booster uh, vaccination may not have uh, done its work properly in my body at the time to be able to allow my body to mount a, a immune response fast enough and I'll still get infected. And then upon getting infect infected because the, 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 the booster hasn't had the time to act, the viral load may be high because of the infection, not because of the vaccine. I hope I hope that explains it somewhat. Yes, yes, thank you, Doctor. That that explains it. And I think we are going to have um, follow-up questions as as we discuss. So um, please be patient with re-explaining some of this stuff because it's really medical, um, it's really medical uh, information that confuses most of us. So, Doctor, just follow following up before I'm gonna go to John Gwenya and I'm gonna go to um, Power M, and I'm going to go to uh, E vessels when I finish this question. Just on the follow up on that, why is there such a big push for everybody to get vaccinated? What about natural immunity? Only, this person says, only about 3% of SA population has been infected, and globally just over 2%. This means that the majority of people people's natural immunity has protected them. Why then make it compulsory to vaccinate? Now, doctor, again, linked to that question. It sounds like, as you mentioned, Panados have uh, side effects and all of this, but a lot of people somehow have seen and read many articles that show or claim to have so many side effects like the doctor that we read about where somebody took the vaccine, as you've explained, and died afterwards. Why should we still take the vaccine when there's such concern about the side effects that the vaccine can cause? I'm hoping that makes sense with those two questions that are linked. Does it make sense, doctor? Um, 
Yes, yes. Um, if, if I forget to answer um, part of the question, please remind me. Yeah, so it's, um, basically the, it's basically the natural immunity. And then why is there push when there's so many side effects that people are talking about? Okay, let's start with the natural immunity. Um, we've only been able to eliminate diseases um, and eradicate some diseases in the world through vaccination. One of those diseases that has been eliminated or, um, in, in our country um, is polio. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember the effects of polio on, 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 on people. Some of you know people who were infected with polio and, and live with the effects of polio today. The only reason we were able to eliminate polio in this country and many other countries in the world is because of vaccinations, not because of, of natural immunity. So, so that's one of the reasons why we are pushing vaccination. The second reason why we are pushing vaccination is because um, if natural immunity was doing an excellent job, we would not today be um, uh, reporting 3 million people that would have died, that have died in this country in, in, in less than two years. 3 million people having died because of one particular condition in this country. You know, um, uh, it's, it's very easy to talk about percentages, you know, uh, 2%, 3%, but if we put that in context, put that 2% and actually say the numbers, if 3 million people in 18 months, 3 million people have died in 18 months just from COVID. Now we have other people that have died from other conditions, which means that the people that have died in this country is, is a lot of people. Second to that, we have people that have not died, that have been infected by COVID, that remain with a, a, a incapacity because of the long-term effects of COVID. We've, got, we, we've coined a syndrome called long COVID, which has got long-term effects which, uh, of COVID, which talks about the long-term effects of COVID. We don't know how, how those people will continue their day-to-day -day activities in the long term with those long-term effects of COVID and, and what's going to happen to them in terms of their um, living or mortality thereof. So um, I think we need to put that in context and that's just in South Africa alone. Um, they bearing in mind that the 3 million that we're talking about is actually people that we know have died from COVID because they've been tested. There are other people that have died from COVID but are not counted as COVID deaths because those, they, they, they were never tested. But we are able to tell that uh, it is likely that those people have died from COVID because we are able to estimate what would have been the expected death toll in South Africa uh, in, in 2020 without COVID. If we continued with all the other causes of death as they were, the expected death toll was this much, but we have a, we have a significant higher death toll than we had in previous years and than anticipated. And the only other addition to the mix is COVID. Bearing in mind also that people's movements have been limited by COVID. So, so people who might have died from car accidents, from violence and from other diseases uh, and, uh, 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 are alive because they, they are, their movements are limited. But that gap of a, a higher percentage or higher numbers of people having died but not counted as COVID is, can be attributed to COVID because of our uh, uh, estimations and traditions. So I think 
um, in answering that in terms of why are we pushing for vaccines is because we want to save people's lives. Why, the question is, um, uh, uh, why are we pushing for vaccines when we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine? I think that was the second part of the question. Mm -hmm. All of those vaccines that you have on your children's charts, we didn't know the long-term effects of them when they were started being used. What we did know when, when vaccine research is being done, we want to check for safety. Is it safe? And we want to check uh, um, uh, for, the, for, the, you know, for the dosage that needs to be used. So we want to make sure that it is safe and the, 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 that, that it, 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 it achieves what it sets out to achieve. It, it's safe and effective. That's what we search for whenever we're doing uh, vaccine research. We do not know the long-term effects of any drug until there is a long-term. That's just the reality of the situation. None of those vaccines in your children's charts we knew the long-term effects of. We can talk about their safety and we can talk about their effectiveness. But like the person uh, 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 indicated, when the long-term effects are being discovered, drugs are recalled. We say stop using that drug because that drug has shown to have certain uh, uh, long-term effects that we were not able to see in the beginning. Now, the question is, when you have a, a, a type of medication that has been shown to be safe, that has been shown to be effective. Do you sit on it and not give it to the people and watch people die because you don't know the long-term effects of it? Or do you actually give people a chance to survive? So, so that's the question that uh, scientists and governments have got to battle with with any medication and any vaccine that is being researched. Hmm. And then to sure. answer the question about uh, the different studies, a study here, a study there, the thing about research, um, anybody can do research and can publish uh, their research findings in a journal article. Um, for that, for those particular findings to be uh, they, to, be, to be found to be uh, uh, appropriate, for a lack of a better word, they have to go through a rigorous process of being compared. So what, what you did in your research, let me be able to duplicate it somewhere else. Yeah? Let me do exactly what you did and be able to produce exactly what you produced. Number two, um, if if you have got multiple people having done research and have the same kind of findings, then only then can we say, yes, that paper that was saying that in Lancet uh, 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 was saying the, the, the true thing. Because um, uh, uh, there may have been uh, uh, did, you know, challenges with um, uh, uh, how the research was done and it might not produce the results that it was supposed to produce or it produces different results or it even produces wrong results. So now we cannot uh, uh, change things based on one study. And we also cannot make conclusions about anything based on one study. One study can shed a light, but then we need to do more of the similar kind of studies in order to be able to confirm or reject those findings. Sure. Yo, doctor. Yeah, your explanations are deep, but they're so simplified and they help us who are not in the medical field to understand. As we move to more people with questions, I again want to reiterate, we are having an open conversation. Feel free to raise your hand and come with your question. Be loving. While you are being, while you are engaging truthfully, we are allowed to ask questions. We are not allowed to disrespect one another. Remember, even if we disagree, we still need to remain loving. Joe Ngwenya, 
are you still with us? Um, I want to give you an option first because I saw your hand was up first, and then I'll move you. I'll move Grigory. We see your hand. M. Bauer, we see your hand. E. Vessels, we see your hand. Um, that uh, Joe Nguenya, are you still with us? Joe, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here, sir, but I'm so upset that you send a message that I'm okay now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, let's move Let's move um, to M. Bauer. I think he was first to raise your hand. Oh, no. Is it? Okay. I think um, uh, Egbert Vessels has uh, shown her screen. So let's go to her first. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, hello. My name is Simona. I'm Egbert's wife using his computer. Oh, I've been sorry. listening now uh, for nearly one hour and a half, and I asked in the beginning if there is any other di discussion but actually the vaccination. And one of the things, is, which is why I thought this was going to be a discussion, is all that I've heard up to now is pro-vaccine, pro-vaccine, and pro-vaccine. There have been a lot of comments here on the side. Um, I am not vaccinated. Oh, and then I just start and then it's outside. Okay, so I don't know what happened now. I don't get it. I don't have to do David, please could you mute yourself? David, please could you mute yourself? I'm actually doing something about it. When you mute it, the moderator can mute well, people if he wants yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah. I'm trying to mute. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, you can Simone. continue. Yeah, you can continue. So Simone. It, it is a bit disturbing to me that we are only discussing the vaccination, which we know has been pushed by every every possible um, uh, government. And this is what we are discussing now. Again, I think most people are aware of a lot of these facts. I would like to know why we're not talking about alternative medicines. We have been treating ourselves prophylactically, alternatively for a year, for, yeah, for nearly a year. We, not, neither of us had got, gotten COVID. And I have personally, I've worked in a research department in Berlin and in Germany for 10 years. We, we were protein chemistry, we did um, um, medicines, and it took 10 years to create something like this. So now that the world is pushing for this vaccination, come rain, come shine, I find it very frightening. And um, so I, I, I thought this was going to be a much bigger bouquet than just vaccination, vaccination, let's get vaccination, even though we don't know the side effects. There, and, and so much data that hasn't come through. If you Google, uh, could there be possible side effects? Uh, if I put that into Google, I will only get government information. So if I want to have other information, I need to find ways to, to get to people that have done research. For example, ivermectin hasn't been mentioned once tonight, which has been used widely in this country and has saved many, many lives. There are ivermectin consultants that treat people. There are things, um, basic things, and we haven't spoken about it. So for one and a half hours, all that we have done is talk about the vaccination, which I personally will never take. My concern is, but, and this is my concern. I don't know. I think, see there are others that are also are other-minded. And I prayed over this for a very long time. I couldn't get peace over it. I've lost Bible studies over it. I've lost friends over it. I didn't have peace in my heart about it. I was ready to go. And then I got actually the first, um, the first video that I saw was by Dr. Robert Malone, um, who is the um, co-inventor of the um, um, mRNA uh, vaccine. So this, his talk convinced me to not get vaccinated. His, his own talk. And the one of the first things that he says is, the, the, what you do not do is during a pandemic, you don't start vaccinating everybody. So I, I think there is so much miscommunication and it's so censored um, or on Facebook, on social media, what is being put out there, it's all fear based messages that are wanting to get us to get vaccinated. And I'm absolutely against this. And nobody has said anything about that. So Thank what you. are there are alternatives and who yeah. is using them? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, please remind me your name. Uh, Simone, Simone. Simone. Thank you. Thank you, Simone, for your contribution. I, I'm not sure if the doctor managed to get your question because 
um, I understand that you wanted to talk about other alternations. I, yeah, let me, let me finish, Simone. Let me finish. Let me finish, Simone. So I think, um, Doctor, I'm going to ask other people to ask their questions. And then maybe if you can remember, you can answer question in batches. Is that fine? So that we don't answer one question and then come back and answer one question, just so that we save time. There are lots of people with answers. So maybe if we can try to answer few questions at the same time, is that fine? I'll take notes. Thank you. And then let's go to um, M. Bauer. Um, maybe if you can ask uh, your question right now. Yes, hi, thank you, uh, Babalo. Um, yeah, just more question to, to you guys, you know, from, uh, um, you know, um, who set up this whole uh, conversation um, on behalf of uh, the vineyard in South Africa. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of, you know, getting your, how can I put it, your experts, and, and with absolute no disrespect to the good doctor that's been giving us, you know, answering some of the questions. I mean, we, we've got, doctors and experts on both sides of the fence. And, and obviously, uh, um, from the answers that I've gotten so far, and the questions that have been asked from, from the doctor that's been speaking to us this evening, is that she would be, uh, um, she's okay with the vaccine in, in that it's safe. And, you know, um, regardless of the long-term effects, etc., of which she self-admitted there is no evidence or, or proof as yet because there's just not, you know, uh, there was not uh, um, long enough research done. But yeah, so just uh, um, from that point of view, there, there are doctors, there are professionals, there are scientists that have exactly the same fears with regards to the vaccine. And it would have been great to have heard their opinion as well. Just a comment from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gregory, uh, you're welcome to ask your question. Hi. Um, yes, I think I was just going to echo similar to Marius. Um, it's very much, I think, uh, you know, I respect the doctor and what she has to share and her point of view on it. Um, I was probably hoping for a little bit of, I suppose, being a, being a church thing. I, I, very much what I'm hearing is what I'm hearing on SABC, ETV. You know, th it's the same mantra that we hear about vaccines. But there's a lot of doctors that are coming out with differing views, and they've certainly been silenced. Like Dr. Robert Malone, who's, who's actually one of the inventors of, of the mRNA. Uh, you can't even actually says it's not even a, a vaccine. It's actually gene therapy. It's genetic therapy. It's moving into the cell producing proteins. So the fact that we're even calling it a vaccine needs to be questioned. Um, and so I think it's more a question to the leadership of us having a more, a more open debate, both spiritually, what, are we, what, what does this mean spiritually um, for us as Christians through the lens of scripture, through the lens of um, you know, our faith and many within the church that I, I know are discerning something very amiss with what's going on, with the way it's been pushed by governments and how, for example, the Gibraltar is 100% vaccinated and they are currently having an outbreak. They have closed the country down. I don't know what the doctor, if the doctor's aware of it. I'm also aware of the FIFA. There's 108 FIFA, registered FIFA players that have died of heart attacks over the past six months. And it is the one uh, presenter tried to explain this on the thing and he was shut down and closed off. So he couldn't share. So I think my question is, why is there only one narrative and why are the doctors that are coming out with differing views being shut down? I suppose it's a bit of a statement as well, but yes. Thank you, Grigory. We appreciate your question. Um, let's go to Gloria. Um, Gloria, are you still here? Yes, hello. Um, my name is actually Inga. Somehow I got the wrong name. I am South <laughs> Welcome, African and Inga. I live. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm a South African, but I live in Canada. And I have been here for two and a half years through this um, pandemic. And I'd just like to make a couple of points. I've just been listening in. And uh, we are, I think, a little bit down the road. 
As far as the rollout of the vaccine goes, we are now vaccinating five to 11 year olds. And um, I am no, by no means an anti-vaxxer, but I think that we need to, to, I just wanna echo what some of the others have been saying. I think that we have to have a very um, clear understanding of what we're dealing with. This is in fact, not a vaccine. Um, it is mRNA gene therapy as the previous uh, speaker uh, highlighted. And I wanted to just say a couple of things as a pastor living in um, Canada. We have found that there's been a gross violation of biblical ethics that have taken place in our country here. And many other countries are following suit. And biblical ethics 101 says that we have to give people freedom of choice. People choose to follow Christ. It's a freedom from God. And, and what is happening here is that people's freedoms have been taken away completely. We are now having church services with vaccine passports are mandatory. And, and there are churches here that, and pastors here that are having to stand up against this. And um, I have family members that are vaccinated. I myself have chosen not to be vaccinated because I believe I have the freedom of choice. And the other problem with is there's no informed consent. There is no, nobody is liable for the damage that will take place in your body if you have been vaccinated. My husband has had heart issues after the vaccination, after his first vaccination, he has been forced to take it because of a job. And there is there are serious problems with what, what is happening. And, and I, I think we have to be very careful to, to push this vaccine mandate um, and coerce people into this, especially in the church. And, and I am grieved at, at how many pastors and leaders are not um, giving people that, that freedom of choice. And so um, as the previous speaker said, there are many scientists and doctors, we have doctors currently in our town here who are not vaccinating and they are very much against these mandates um, and this coercion from the government. So I think the church is in a very crucial, crucial place. And we as leaders have to be very careful about how we walk this out. Um, yeah. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Inga, for that contribution. Yes. Um, so, Doctor, before I before I go to you, um, can I just speak from a, from a pastoral point of view, um, since we've organised this as the vineyard? Um, I think it's important for all of us to understand that the hope of organising this conversation was to create a platform where we can have a robust debate where we can have a crucial conversation, where we can hear different um, point of views from people who will bring their questions. So we are not creating this platform and making it a pro-vaccine platform. We are creating it and we've asked the doctor to come on the platform to answer difficult questions that people might have that are raised or that still have issues or hesitations with the vaccination. Yes, it is valid that we should have had other doctors who share different view. At our disposal, we had Dr. Zianda Wundle, who offered her time to come be with us. And we are hoping that people who share a different view can come on this platform like they have come and they can ask their questions, they can debate their points and the doctor can help us understand from that perspective. So in my view, it is happening. People are sharing their different point of views and we are going to give the doctor a chance to respond. It is not a for or against thing. It is an open conversation for us to robustly have a discussion. And I'm hoping by that, we are not creating a, a dialogue. I'm just responding from a vineyard point of view and saying, we are learning as we do these things and hopefully in future 
we will be able to find contacts of other people and create another platform where we can engage more. Doctor, I hope you've, you've seen some of the questions and you've heard some of the questions. Can you please uh, respond to some of the stuff people have said? Thank you. Um, I think that the, the few speakers that have just uh, spoken just now um, were actually posing comments rather than questions and comments posed um, at, at the church's leadership more than uh, questions posed at, at myself. But I'm going to try and um, uh, respond to some of those comments from my own point of view. Firstly, I want to reiterate that I'm not here representing government. I am not talking on behalf of government. I am here because I was asked and I volunteered to come in my own personal time, in my own personal capacity. So this is not the mouthpiece of government talking. This is a medical scientist talking, a medical specialist talking uh, in her own personal capacity. Having said that, I do um, uh, acknowledge and respect uh, uh, other people's opinions, even in my own family for that matter. If I'm not about to, to push people, to force people to do what they do not want to do. All I can do is to provide them with the information as I know it and as I have in my own uh, uh, disposal. That's all I can do. Having said that, I am not trained in alternative medicine. I cannot talk about alternative medicine. Yes, there are uh, other research that have been done in other uh, um, um, drugs, other than just the COVID vaccinations, but in all of those uh, 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 drugs that have been researched, they have not been recommended. Although people are using them, um, and are able to say their own successes according to what they've experienced, they have not necessarily been recommended for, for, for use uh, in, in the fight against COVID, some of those drugs. So I cannot talk about something that I have no experience in, and I cannot be promoting something that I have no experience in. All I can promote is what I know and what I myself have used. Uh, I have been vaccinated. I have not experienced severe side effects. Having said that, it's not to say that the people who have experienced severe side effects, I'm not nullifying that. Their, their, their experiences are their experiences and their experiences are valid. And I do hope that those, ex those people's uh, experiences have been investigated and, and, and the response has been appropriate. Secondly, I cannot talk about the spiritual lens. I, I, am not a, 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 I am not an authority on, on the Bible and the spiritual matters. So I cannot talk to that. I, I won't be able to, to respond to that. So I think that's, that's all I can say in those comments because there were comments not so much as questions. I, I encourage robust discussion and people having differing opinions. And my opinion and my knowledge and experience is just one individual's opinion and one individual's knowledge and experience. Well, thanks, doctor. Thanks for that. We appreciate that point of view. And doctor, I think right now, it is maybe time for us to move to uh, Pribello's uh, question that we said will push towards the end regarding how South Africa was trying to be responsible and how the world has responded to South Africa and other countries. Are you, do you think you are ready to maybe respond to that question? Um, can, can you ask the question again? Um, Rivello's question um, was that, wasn't it, if I remember correctly, if Rivello is still with us, but the question was, wasn't it the responsible thing for South Africa to do to respond or to announce the variant found in the country? And what's your thoughts on how the international world has responded to, to our announcing of this variant and um, 
what else did she ask? I think I think that was the gist of her question, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, no, that's uh, correct. I, um, so it was really around here? the issue. Yes, I am. It was really around the issue of protocol to say, did we break any kind of protocol in how we announced um, the discovery of this new variant? Um, because looking at the response that we've had, uh, it, it feels almost as if we broke some kind of protocol or should we maybe have waited until we understood it a little better before then going to the world and is that standard practice? Okay, thank you very much, Tabelo. So um, we've had many, many variants with COVID and uh, across the world and, and, and many of these variants have been detected in other countries in the world and not necessarily detected in South Africa. We've only had two variants detected in South Africa. Remember what I also said that uh, South Africa detects does not necessarily mean it originated here. The very first variant, which we then termed uh, alpha, um, was detected in Wuhan in China. Um, now, in terms of uh, the communication about that variant, um, the, the, the Cabello asked whether at what point should countries communicate? Should they communicate uh, once they know everything about the virus or should they communicate uh, early on? Um, and Cabello also asked um, how other countries communicated the variants. Um, I can talk about the very first variant and its communication. Um, that very first variant was communicated uh, when it already spread to other countries, unfortunately. Um, and it was communicated when, um, when, when the scientist that discovered it um, had already started to study it to see what it does, what symptoms it causes, um, and have started to do some research in terms of it uh, uh, to find a vaccine for it. Now, um, was that wrong for, for them to wait until that point? All right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I cannot say that whether that was wrong or right, but what I can say is that there are international health regulations that govern these things. And the international re health regulations require that uh, countries report as soon as possible in order to contain the spread and it, in order to ensure that research is done as quickly as possible. So South Africa's um, communication about this variant was according to the regulations and on point. I can't speak about the other countries and the other countries know uh, better about their communication strategies with re uh, regards to the variants. But what I can say is that the world likes to panic uh, whenever the Africans announce something. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, I don't know what to call it, but they, they like um, to panic quite a lot and create, um, let's close off Africa kind of situation. So, um, and, and whereas other variants have been detected in other uh, uh, countries and the response was not necessarily the same. So um, I am not in support of how the world reacted to this Omicron variant. Um, and, and, and I think my reservation about the world's reaction um, is also being observed by many other people to such an extent that some other countries that reacted harshly are revisiting their decisions now because they realize that they reacted um, harshly and that may not have been necessary. Sure. Trivello, I'm hoping that you were answered. We are still receiving questions on the chat box and we are still having this robust um, conversation. So doctor, um, many, of, many of us, obviously, as we land this claim, many of us, and as we've had on the discussions, some people really have serious um, reservations about the vaccine. Um, and 
and I, 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 I want to just know from your point of view, if, if, as we've seen with the South African response to the vaccine has been slow, it started fast and then it slowly uh, slowed down. What are some of the risks if we do not get the momentum going? And what are some of the risks if most of us do not vaccinate in future against this um, virus? The reason why we are, the reason why we are encouraged people to get vaccinated is simply put to reduce the chances of severe disease and to reduce the deaths. Um, we've been, like I've explained earlier, we have lost a lot of people. I personally have lost family members close to me. Um, so we, we do not want to continue going through this for a very long time. Um, we do not want another Spanish flu, which was one of the devastating uh, influenza viruses uh, of the, um, in the 1980s. We do not want that kind of situation. So that's why we are asking, um, we are encouraging people to get vaccinated. The fear is that if people do not get vaccinated, we will continue, um, the, 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 the disease or the virus will continue unabated and we will not be able to break its transmission. And we will continue having more and, more and more people getting severely ill and dying from the disease. Sure, okay. Thank you so much, doctor, for that answer. There is, there is maybe the last question, looking at the time, hopefully we can get two or three, um, but there's a question that is from someone here, Judy. She says, some South African doctors, COVID healthcare workers coalition, I don't know if you've heard about that uh, doctor, have been analyzing blood in, of, of a fully, can we ask Arnold, Arnold, can you please mute your, um, is it Arnold or Donald? Arnold, please mute, mute your mic, please. Thank you. Doctor, it says that um, some South African doctors, uh, it says COVID healthcare workers coalition, have been analyzing blood of in fully jabbed sick people using a sample blood smear under microscope. And they have found that the red blood cells have clumped together in what is called rulex. I don't know if doctor, that's a, uh, I'm pronouncing it correctly. Have you done any blood smears under microscopes, especially with jab patients um, experiencing extreme fatigue? Is there, doctor, I don't know if you're able to answer that medical question. I haven't participated in that study myself. So no, I have not looked at blood under a microscope. Ah, okay, thank you. Judy, you've received your question there. I mean, your answer from the doctor, thank you. Um, anybody else who feels we haven't answered their question? Doctor, there's, there's another question here that says, um, Obviously, this is from even the beginning. People always said, when we're fully vaccinated, we won't get COVID. Why is it that so many people after getting the jab still are exposed to this virus and they're still getting the virus? Um, I don't think any of us that are talking about vaccine and pro-vaccine have actually ever said, if you are vaccinated, you will not get COVID. I think the communication has been very carefully phrased to say, if you get vaccinated, you will reduce your chances of severe disease and death. So when, when, um, when research is done on vaccines and other medications, there's endpoints that uh, researchers want to see. The various endpoints, one might be, death, another severe disease, another disease of any kind. Um, so with the vaccines that we have, they do not protect person from getting infected. They prevent the individual from getting severe disease and death. And, and, and I've, I've explained this 
earlier uh, when I was making an example of the flu vaccine that we have been using and getting flu vaccinations for generations. Um, but people still get flu. And especially when we've got a new flu uh, virus variant, people still get flu. But we do not hear about people dying from, from flu as, as much um, if they are vaccinated. Because the, the, the reason why we vaccinate, especially the very young and the very old, we vaccinate them from flu is to prevent them from dying of flu. So the same applies with the COVID vaccine is to prevent people from dying or getting severely ill because of the infection. It's not to say they will not get infected. Sure. Yo, doctor, it's been, it's been a tough um, engagement that we've had this evening. And it's been fun at the same time because it's good for us to wrestle with different point of views and also give information and clarity on in areas where we need to give clarity. So I think, again, to respect people's times and also just to make sure that we we, we, we end on time. We want to say we are not going to be able to respond to every question that has been asked because of limitations of time, but we are hoping to continue to have this robust, crucial conversations about how we respond, especially as believers, to these um, uh, uh, daily struggles that we find, because today can be COVID and next week it will be something else. So it's important for us to continue wrestling with love regarding these issues that we face. So Dr. Ziander, from all of us here, we, we, we want to thank you really, and we want to honor you for your time that you've provided to us freely and for you to come be on this platform we, with us. And to everybody who's joined from all across the African continent and from other people from Canada and other places, we want to thank you also for taking the time and um, engaging with us on this crucial, crucial conversation. So thank you. We love the engagement and we want to continue having these crucial conversations with the same love, with the same approach, with obviously um, an aim to build one another and continuing to show love to the world that even when we disagree, we can still show love to one another. So thank you, everybody. And we will send out another uh, invite when we have other conversations that we will host on this platform. And send us your suggestions on other conversations that you think we should have uh, conversations about. With that, we'd like to just say thank you, good night, and hope to see you soon. Shab shab. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time and your ears and your engaging um, comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Good night, everybody.